we jump into the message, I'd like to read the text John McVeigh will be speaking on. Matthew 5, verses 38 to 48, from the English Standard Version Bible. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You therefore must be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. The little Austrian town of Wunzedel carries the burden of a difficult past. It was the burial place of Rudolf Hess, uh, the deputy Fuhrer to Adolf Hitler. And it endures an unhappy present because Year after year, on National Heroes Remembrance Day, uh, neo-Nazis return to honor Hess. In 2001, the 1,000 citizens of Wunzedel managed to have Hess's remains exhumed and his gravestone demolished. But sadly, it did no good. The neo-Nazis still return year after year. And this past fall, the citizens of Wunzedel find themselves asking two very profound questions. How do you deal with evil? And how should you treat your enemies? And it is to those two questions that Jesus turns in Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 to 48, verses that have sometimes been labeled the most challenging ethic in all the New Testament. Johann Georg Hamann once wrote, the more edifying the speaker, the heavier his Galilean shibboleth weighs on our ears which I take to me that it is risky to try to explain Jesus' words and riskier still to explain them away. We must hear Jesus and enter into the wonder of his identity as new lawgiver and divine poet. Our passage is divided into two parts each introduced by the now familiar formula, you have heard that it was said, but I say unto you. Jesus, as the new lawgiver, first offers his replacement for an important Old Testament law, the lex talionis, the law of proportional retaliation. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth intended to limit the scope of retribution, it was misused to defend retaliation, offering a parody of the golden rule, do unto others whatever they do unto you. For all of its straightforward logic, Lex Talionis proves tragically deficient, drawing its adherence into a vicious cycle of violence. It is the law of street gangs and Middle Eastern politics. For Lex Talionis to have talons, you must keep vividly alive the memory of past grievances, the last eye poked out, the last tooth knocked out. And in that grim record, you must find the inspiration, the fire to strike back. The hoped for end game, point proven. Score settled, vengeance achieved for a moment, for a millisecond, a millisecond of satisfaction until the logic of the law of retribution shifts to one's enemies. 
But it's not just the law of street gangs and Middle Eastern politics. It's our law, too. We've translated it into a thousand contemporary phrases that live in our own consciousness. Ones like, give as good as you get. Don't let anybody push you around. It's the sort of advice we give to our kids when they're bullied on the playground, and it's the sort of advice by which we live. We expect justice from others, and if we don't get it, we will defend our rights to the hilt. Jesus offers his startling substitute. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you, do not resist the one who is evil. Jesus replaces the law of retaliation with the law of non-resistance. Give up, give in. Don't so much as lift a finger against the evil one. And then adding to our surprise and bafflement, Jesus offers up four case studies. Case study number one. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Case study number two, and if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, your undergarments, your underwear, uh, let him have your cloak, your outer garments, your dress or your shirt and pants as well. Case study number three, and if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Case study number four. Give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. Jesus advocates amazing generosity in these case studies, creative generosity. For someone to strike your right cheek, he must do so with the back of his hand which was an ultimate insult in the culture of the day. But to turn the other, the left cheek, is to invite a different act, for to slap with the open hand is the act of one, is the act one takes against an equal. If in a court of law you give both your underwear and your shirt and pants, you then stand naked exposing both yourself and the nefarious, overreaching motives of your accuser. And if you go the extra mile, you undermine the whole notion of the forced march, recovering your independence, your identity as a philanthropist rather than a victim. Jesus invites us to live out amazing, creative generosity. In the second half of our passage, verses 43 to 48, Jesus draws again on the wisdom of the Old Testament. You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, verse 43. And he offers another startling replacement. But I say unto you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And then Jesus, the new lawgiver, gives four arguments in support of his new law. Argument number one, so that you may be the sons of your Father who is in heaven, for he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. Argument number two consists of two questions, searching questions. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? Argument number three offers a similar pair of questions. And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? And then returning to the theme of the heavenly father with with which these arguments began, Jesus offers this stunning rationale, argument number four. You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. In Jesus' invitation, his command as the new lawgiver to turn away from retribution and hatred and toward extreme generosity and unfathomable love, we hear the voice of Jesus and we are stunned and even traumatized by it. 
And we are left with a whole passel of questions, two of which particularly fascinate me. Question one, how much law is there in this passage? Or to put it another way, does Jesus really intend us to, to behave like this? In our quest to replace sterile law-keeping, legalism, and perfectionism with grace, it is easy to overlook a simple fact. The authors of the New Testament cannot conceive of a sin or habit that cannot be overcome. For them, the presence of sin in the lives of believers must be fleeting, temporary, and doomed. Why? The one has come. So when Jesus adjusts Old Testament dictums, it is not to dumb them down. Instead, he deepens and strengthens them. He accommodates them to the truth about himself and his presence in the human story. With Jesus on the scene, all the bowing and scraping to the failings of human nature is at an end. You have heard it said, but I say unto you, with Christ on the scene, there is new potential for human flourishing, new hope that justice and generosity can enter the human story and transform humankind. There's a scandal here in the Sermon on the Mount, but it is not the scandal of so little law. It is the scandal of so much. It is the scandal of the new lawgiver, Jesus. If we forget that, we will dumb down and dismiss, and we will have little chance of hearing the authentic voice of Jesus and being transformed by it. So there's plenty of law in our passage. Question number two, is there any grace to be found here? Well, yes. First, the passage is all about disciples of Jesus becoming the sources of refracted grace, the refracted grace and generosity of God. Think with me here. We usually keep the vertical and horizontal spiritual planes quite separate. In our self-centeredness, we expect God to react in grace toward us on the vertical plane. And we expect others on the horizontal plane to treat us justly and fairly. So the vertical plane, the relationship between God and ourselves is governed by the principle of grace and the horizontal plane, our relationships with others is governed by the principle of justice and fair play. In an important respect, Jesus conflates the vertical and the horizontal spiritual planes. There is a single principle operative in both, says Jesus, the principle of grace and generosity. What shifts between the two planes is not the principle, but the actor. In the vertical plane, God is the actor and we the recipients. On the horizontal plane, we, mimicking God as his children, offer grace and generosity to others. This is nothing short of revolutionary, a direct assault on all the well-worn ways of being human, which are invariably focused on the self, self-preservation, and self-exaltation. There's another place that we find grace in this story. Tons of grace are stored up in those two precious phrases that Jesus uses here, sons, children of your Father who is in heaven and your heavenly Father. Jesus is not offering new laws as a way of cueing a new legalism with new checklists. As divine poet, he is awakening our imaginations. What does it mean as children of the Father to live out his generosity? What does that mean? Allow me to adapt a wonderful little parable by Stephen Westerholm. It goes like this. The family needs a shed 
father, a skilled carpenter, can build it. He chooses to use the project to teach his twin eight-year-old daughters, Jill and Jane, a little something about carpentry. Jill, though, decides she would rather try to build a shed on her own. She offers up a flurry of activity, a lot of sawing and hammering, though not a whole lot of measuring. <laughs> uh, Jane could cast a wistful eye to her twin's apparent progress if she were not so busy being daddy's pupil. His hand joins hers on the hammer in driving those early nails. They measure carefully twice, and each time she and dad agree on the measurement. She watches dad saw in a straight line, hears the lecture on how to do it, and does it a few times with dad's hand over hers on the saw. Eventually, she does it herself. True, the project is not very efficient. It takes way more time than it should, and they throw away a lot of bent nails and some boards with stray cuts. But in the end, there it is, a sturdy, well-built shed, and Jane announces proudly to any visitor, look, here's our new shed. I built it myself. And a fine shed it is. Jill's project, all askew, incomplete, is a jumbled heap of lumber. She, too, can say, I built it myself. But then the excuses flow. It's really nothing but a mess. And she's relieved when the next morning she sees Dad removing her eyesore of a shed. You see, when your father asks you to do something, he promises his presence. He's there with you. In Westerholm's words, when a child is eager and willing to help, a competent dad will see to it that the job gets done. Those creative uh, citizens of Wunzadel ponder the big questions. How do you deal with evil and how should you treat your enemies? And they come up with some fabulous, creative, generous strategies in a campaign they label Rex Gagan Rex, right against right. And they come up with, uh, with some strategies that are most fascinating to turn the neo-Nazi rally this past November 15 into a most fascinating charity walk. As the march begins, the pro Hess marchers have not a clue that they will be the ones raising the money. <laughs> the villagers having contributed a kitty of 10,000 euros, donate money for every meter the marchers complete. And where will that money go? To Exit Deutschland, a charity that helps people leaving neo-Nazi groups. The villagers set up motivational signs along the route, encouraging the Nazis as they walk. They, they paint... They paint progress markers along the way, congratulating the marchers for raising still more euros. As they near the finish line, good food awaits them under a banner that reads, Mein Mampf, my food. <laughs> and when the neo-Nazi pro Hess marchers cross the finish line, the villagers shower them with confetti, while a large sign congratulates them for raising money for Exit Deutschland. <laughs> Don't you wonder if they're going to be back this year? <laughs> In a bid to hear the Galilean shibboleth of Jesus, I conclude with a paraphrase, a rather loose one, of Matthew 5, verses 38 through 48. You know the hackneyed sayings, give as good as you get, don't let anybody push you around. If you don't stand up for yourself, nobody will. You've got to watch out for number one. Replace all those lame proverbs with this one. When you're up against someone really evil, surrender. Don't even put up a fight. Here's how to practice my new law. If somebody slugs you, let him do it again. If anyone sues you for everything you've got except the clothes on your back, give it all away, including the clothes on your back. If a hitch hitchhiker wants 10 miles out of you, drive him 20. 
If someone comes to you with a handout, fill it. And don't ever refuse anybody who asks you for a loan. Here are some more worn-out rules that keep you from living generously. Take care of your friends, but don't trust your enemies any further than you can throw them. Instead of following all that tired, run-of-the-mill wisdom, try this. Pamper your enemies. Get down on your knees and beg God to be merciful to anyone who tromps on your reputation. That way, you'll be a true son and a real daughter of your Father in heaven. He makes his son rise just the same on mean-spirited people and good-hearted ones and sends the same nourishing rain down on the citizen of the year and the jailbird. If you love only the members of your own fan club, have you done anything special? The stingiest, meanest people around act like that. If you only say nice things to your own crowd, have you risen above average? Raw pagans do that. In order to be different, to stand out, to really excel at this thing called life, do this. Mimic your heavenly father. Act just as mature and moral and grown up as he. Be the true children of your generous heavenly father. Amen and amen. In his message, John notes that Jesus replaces the law of retaliation with the law of non-resistance. How would the world be different if we all moved to the law of non-resistance? John notes that by adopting the law of non-resistance, we act on behalf of God in dispensing grace to others rather than being concerned for self and self-preservation. In your local setting, how can you dispense grace to those who seem undeserving of it, just as God does to us? If you'd like more information on The One Project, or you would enjoy watching one of these presentations again, please visit them at www.theoneproject.org. That's www.thenumberoneproject.org. If you were moved by this presentation, we would invite you to experience a One Project gathering in person. The upcoming gatherings are listed on the website. Be blessed until we meet again.